Open your Bibles again to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and we ended last time with verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And now verse 18. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Now there's two kinds of nets that are commonly used by net fishermen. I think we spoke of this a little bit in our Wednesday night Bible class last week. There's a cast net which is thrown out into a circle, it's spread out in a circle, and it can expand from about six feet out to 14 feet. And the, the line on the edges are weighted so that the fisherman tosses it out, usually standing in very shallow water, and it, the weight carries it down to the bottom of the water. And then with a drawstring, he closes it in like that, and then pulls in to see what he might have snagged. And then there's a, a sweep or a drag net which requires more than one man to operate. And I had a chance to do some fishing one evening with five other guys when I was in Bible school in the Gulf of Mexico down in Pensacola. And we had, oh, it must have been, they can range from different lengths, 100 to 400 feet long. And uh, you get out a little bit farther, a little deeper, and uh, several guys let out the net and till it, encircles a larger, much larger area, and we all sat on the shore pulling it in. Of course, you can imagine how much heavier it is pulling something like that through water. And uh, caught a lot of mullet that night. We were there, it was, must have been 11, 30, 12, 12, 30 at night. And one of the guys took it home, and between him and his wife, they sliced and diced, and we had fried fish for lunch the next day at his house. It was a great um, experience, great learning experience. There's a spiritual um, observation you can also make. You know, a lot of people will respond to the gospel. Some will be much more profitable than others, unfortunately. Not every Christian, for some reason, don't ask me why. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. But some Christians just never seem to develop or form a desire to want to serve Jesus Christ, to please Jesus Christ, to do something to bring somebody else to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I was talking with some friends recently about tossing a cast net out into the Ganges River. You know, the Ganges River, where the Hindus in India consider the most sacred holy river in the world, and uh, they cremate their loved ones, and if they run out of wood uh, along the, the river's edge, and uh, they toss in the uncremated remains into the water, and they had to import a bunch of flesh-eating turtles to live in that area about 20 years ago to hang in that area and uh, finish consuming what the fires failed to consume because they ran out of wood in the funeral pyre. So there's that, and then there are, and since uh, uh, Hindu, the India, don't kill cattle or beef for food because they consider the cow and the bull to be the most sacred of all animals just below man. So they don't kill the cow. And you have cows drinking and then defecating all over the place in the, in the water, and people tossing their garbage and their trash in it. And so for every one fish you might catch that's actually edible, you might get 50 pounds of garbage and sewage along with it. So you get all kinds when you fish by net. But uh, there's a great a lot of spiritual object lessons you can draw from that. And the, the significance of the first two disciples being fishermen is not always apparent when you're reading through the Bible. Crossing some body of water to get to the blessing on the other side is a running theme throughout the Word of God. 
Israel crossed the Red Sea to leave the uh, Egyptians and Pharaoh's army behind. And everything, every enticement of Egypt, a type of sin. Oh, they would, a number of times they talked about going back to Egypt, or God warned them not to go back to Egypt. You know, you want to be someplace where at least you knew what to expect from day to day, where you had some measure of comfort and predictability from what your, to what your day would hold for you. To live by faith, we walk by faith, not by sight. You don't always know what's going to come to you as you live your life for the sake of Jesus Christ. But uh, to and always playing it comfortable and always playing it safe, uh, you're depriving yourself of some opportunity to be a blessing to someone or to speak to someone about their, their need or to answer someone's Bible question or to be a, a blessing to them, if at all possible. But crossing some body of water, Israel crossed the Jordan River to enter into their inheritance after wandering around for 40 years in the <coughs> deserts. <clears throat> water baptism of new believers. Of course, water baptism itself doesn't save anybody. It gets you wet. That's the extent of it. But it's an outward indication that something has changed on the inside. You are burying the old man, leaving the old nature behind, and now your desire is to live a new life for the glory of Jesus Christ. That's what water baptism signifies. It's the first public, really the first public testimony of a new believer given in the New Testament. One that everyone that is also an already a believer recognizes. If that person is willing to go all the way to be baptized publicly in front of others, and, and by doing so, you are testifying that I've trusted Jesus Christ to save me. My old nature I'm going to consider to be dead, and the new nature by the Holy Spirit I want to be alive to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. You're also anticipating your own death one day. When you die, and uh, just like the old nature, the old man is being buried in type in water, when you die and uh, look forward to the day you come forth to a glorified new body at the rapture of the saints. So all of these things are indicated, they, they, are, they are testified to or, or foreshadowed in a believer's baptism, going from uh, one thing to something much better. And there's a, uh, we sing in imagery, when the darkness I see, he'll be waiting for me. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Songwriters have written about death uh, using that metaphor, that image of crossing Jordan representing death to reach the promised land, uh, heaven, on the other side. And there's a great body of water between the earth and the third heaven. God divided the waters between heaven and earth there in Genesis chapter 1, about verses 4 through 7, 4 through 8, along in there. And speaking of God, Job said, which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, Job 9, verse 8. And so when Christ came, he came to the disciples walking on the water in the Sea of Galilee, John chapter 6. Just as the Bible had foreshadowed, had, had mentioned, the attributes of the actions of God were seen in the life and the actions of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Psalm 148, verse 4. We don't think that there may be some body of water separating our earth from the third heaven. And uh, maybe one day modern cosmologists will come to that revelation. They'll discover it while it's been laying in our Bible all along for centuries. That's usually how things go. They finally catch up with the Word of God inadvertently. Um, math, and also in this verse, verse 18, Matthew is writing in hindsight, so he knows Peter's, Peter, Simon Peter's surname before he, before he records the event in Matthew 16, where Christ said, 
for thou shalt be called Peter, and so forth. Now let's continue, Matthew 4, verses 19 and 20. And he saith unto them, Peter and John, or, or uh, Peter and Andrew, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Matthew summarizes a lot of detail in the way he writes in these two verses. Andrew had no doubt heard John the Baptist preaching earlier, John chapter 1, verse 40. And so in this event here in Matthew 4, Christ comes walking along the shore and Andrew bringing his brother Simon Peter to the Lord Jesus Christ, which, which he gives us more detail about in John chapter 1. And there's also a great spiritual lesson to be seen in that about every believer bringing their brother or bringing their sister to the Lord Jesus Christ. There used to be a, we used to have a sign on the wall. It was the words of General William Booth of the Salvation Army. Others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Let me live for others that I may live like thee. And I was thinking just a minute ago, others could also be brothers. Brothers, Lord, yes, brother. If you are a true believer, wouldn't you want your family members to come to the same understanding of the Lord Jesus, to be saved by the same grace of God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and understand that it has nothing to do with their efforts or their works or anything they can become a member of or belong to? You can, be a, you can have a lot of religion and still have nothing real. Water baptism can't wash away the sin that's in your heart. You might be an official member at some church or in a denomination, but your name might not be written in heaven. So there's a great distinction that needs to be made between people who are trying to get to God through their own efforts. I think, uh, and I've said this before, the theme song of all the people in hell, Brother Lee likes this one, the theme song of everybody in hell is, I did it my way. I was working a funeral service, my day job in the mortuary, and sure enough, some family played that song in tribute to their dad, so I recorded part of it on my cell phone. And I was going to play it for you here one day, but I'll leave the cell phone out of it. <laughs> but uh, people who end up in hell thinking all of their efforts were good enough to impress God, God will be proud of me. God will be pleased with me. But you die without trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with what you can do. It is, are you trusting the one who already did everything for you? Amen. If you have him, say amen. amen. And if you don't have him, that's between you and God. But... Um, Everyone should be mindful of their own family members and pray that God would open the door of conversation. Brother Lee is going to go visit uh, a sister in Australia, and she's caught up in another religious group that wants to deny the deity and the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And There's always some element of me, I have to do something. There's something I have to do or there's something I can do to earn my salvation or to make it complete. Colossians 2 verse 9 says that in him Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so the idea that once I've trusted Jesus Christ, he's forgiven me of my sins. I know my name is in the Lamb's book of life. I know the Holy Spirit lives inside of me that I need to make it, I, I'm going to make it better by speaking in tongues, or, <laughs> or I'm going to join this particular organization, or I'm going to do any number of things just to make, make sure of it, to put icing on, on the cake, right? to make sure it's perfect and complete. If he can't do it all and do it completely for you, there's nothing you can do to add to it. So you have to trust that by faith, the Lord Jesus Christ is willing to save whosoever will, will call upon him. And he'll do, he'll do it uh, for sure, for certain, and forever, and keep it, and do it right. 
But uh, verses 22 and 23. And they immediately left the ship and their father. Oh, wait, let me back up. I skipped a verse. Verse 21. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left their ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all, uh, excuse me, all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. The first four men Jesus chooses are in pairs. There's a third pair among the apostles, which doesn't get reminded, or people aren't reminded of very often. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts 1 and verse 13. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. Now, if you pay, that's not Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot has already gone out and hanged himself. So there's only 11 listed in verse 13 there. But James and his brother Judas, both sons of Zelotes, uh, both disciple, uh, both brothers. Uh, so there are three pairs of brothers in the uh, 12 disciples that Christ had chosen. Verse 23, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. According to verse 17, this is going to be the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. It would pertain to the nation of Israel, a physical, literal, earthly, visible kingdom. And Israel returned to its restored prominence over the other nations under her Messiah. It says, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Keep your place here, and let's go back to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, signs and wonders, including miraculous healing, make their first appearance here in Exodus chapter 4. And I'm going to start reading at verse, uh, verse 5, down through verse 8. Exodus 4, verses 5 to 8. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. So when God told Moses to put his hand into his bosom, or into his clothing, and he pulled it out, and suddenly it was covered with leprosy, or riddled with it. He says, put it back in. He pulled it out a third time, and it was healed. That's the very first time anyone in the Bible is said to have been sick or had any kind of disease. In 50 chapters of the book of Genesis, nobody was sick uh, or had any kind of uh, illness or disease upon them. Uh, you don't read about anyone having any kind of affliction, physical affliction, until this instance here in Exodus chapter 4. Now, presumably, the, they were accustomed to seeing people sick, and they were already sick,
but it wasn't mentioned in the Word of God until right here in Exodus chapter 4. In fact, their history began with uh, miracles that way. Look, at, look for, farther in Exodus 4, starting at verse 29. Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses. You recall Aaron was Moses' spokesman. And did the signs in the sight of the people. Now notice what happens after he did that. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Signs and miracles began with the nation of Israel, and they were intended to get the attention of the nation of Israel. And so the very first time these things are displayed, you recall the first one was casting the rod on the ground, and it becomes a serpent, and Moses picks it up, or Aaron does the same, picks it up, turns back into a rod, and then he says, how about the, your hand becoming leprous? And so he does that, and... The first reaction is the people believed. It was to persuade and convince the Jew that God had, in fact, sent them. And they should believe what these prophets were, or Moses the prophet and Aaron, his spokesman, was, were saying to them. Uh, and it was a sign intended to be between God and the nation of Israel. Look forward at Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 15, and here, look at verse 26. Exodus 15, verse 26, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. This was a sign between God and the nation of Israel. Not a sign for every charismatic who's watching Benny Hinn on television. It was a sign between God and the nation of Israel. That their God was one who could heal disease and heal sickness if they would be obedient to his laws and commandments. By the way, you find no such promise no such guarantee in the New Testament. You and I walk by faith, not by sight. And uh, if one is sick, the, the book of James says, let the elders of the church uh, pray over him, anointing him with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And God would raise him up. But even then, the Bible tells us in the book of 1 John, you and I ought to pray, if the Lord will, we shall do this and do that. So we bring our needs to God. We bring our request for some physical healing to God. But we're told we walk by faith, not by sight. So we bring our needs to God. We bring our desires, our, our hopes to God, even when it pertains to physical sickness and healing. But there is no cut-and-dried, ironclad guarantee that whatever you ask of God, you're going to get it. You ask God to, like these nuts up in Northern California a few couple months ago, they're praying about someone's uh, dead little girl. How, was she, how old was she? Four, five, six, who suddenly uh, was found dead in her bed and no apparent cause of death. And So the whole charismatic church starts getting on the Internet and Facebook asking people around the world to pray that God would raise this little girl back to life again. What a bunch of nuts. You say, well, that's not very respectful, Pastor Shrive. Yeah, but they're doing great disservice to the cause of Christ. They're great, doing great disservice to the Word of God and to people who have suffered hardships before them. You know, if you had had enough faith, your grandma would have gotten better. Maybe not. They're doing a great disservice and an insult to people who have gone through as tragic as losing a, a young child would be. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody. There are nevertheless 
people in the world who suffer far worse from day to day. I'm not trying to minimize their loss. I wouldn't want to do that. But you're doing a great disservice to them who, are, who have their hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. They've asked God if God would be willing to touch their little boy, their little girl, raise them up, get them well. And a loving parent, loving father and mother would gladly trade places with that child if they could. But we ought to pray, if the Lord will, we shall live, we shall do this, we shall do that. That's about all you can do. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. Amen. Leave the rest with him. Sometimes you get the answer along those lines. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is wait. I have something better. Or yes, but not just yet. Excuse me. So these guys that hold out a false hope, if you send in, tuck in your love gift, dear prayer partner, help keep us on the air, God's going to bless you and reward your pocketbook and reward your finances. Or he's going to raise up your... My dad and I were watching TBN years ago and Paul and Jan Crouch were still alive and I think they had Kenneth Copeland on as a guest in their studio. Kenneth Copeland. That guy he looks like he's got demons inside of him. You just see his crazy eyes when he's But he you know, they asked Brother Copeland to pray and, and uh, pray for those who are watching. You know, and he's in the middle of his prayer and someone out there you're you've lost your arm. You had it severed in a very severe accident, and uh, God is God's showing me God is beginning to grow that arm back. That arm is coming back into fullness uh, as it used to be. God, someone out there is getting a brand new arm growing on their, their stump of a body. Boy, that would have made been front page news all around the world if it had happened. See, they, they say these things with just enough deniability, or plausibility, rather, or not deniability, rather. Well, they didn't call us and let us know, so I don't know who they were. Listen, if, if God can give you the details of someone out in TV land who's watching, and uh, he had a, you know, arthritis in his shoulder, and suddenly it's getting better, he can give you the name, the address, and the phone number of the person. And why is it that God always hits these guys with great revelation when they're on the air? Right. Do you think he goes to the supermarket with his wife and, oh, my God, there's a sale of clean peaches on aisle six, you know? <laughs> the Lord just told me there's a mattress sale down the street and such and such, you know. Show me a mattress store that's not always on sale. That doesn't always <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the presidents would be gratified to know that we celebrate their birthdays with a mattress sale. <laughs> But why are, the, why are these guys always having these great revelations when the cameras are on, when they're on the air? And the, probably it all stops as soon as they're off the air. Because they're going into an act. It's an act. A true believer who's got his nose in the Bible begins to spot a phony out there. You begin to see it's all superficial, shallow. It's all an act. It's a very well-orchestrated stage play. You see Benny Hinn? You know, those, those big rallies he'd have in different sports arenas. He's walking back and forth on the stage, and he always wears a white suit when he's having these big appearances. You've got Madison Square Garden, and you've got you know, 30,000 people have squeezed in there to see Benny Hinn and some miracle crusade. And uh, he's walking back and forth on the stage in a white suit, and 60 rows back, there's a spotlight hitting him so that the image people in the audience see is this glowing figure. The spotlight's following him back and forth on the stage, and it gives this glowing image of him. So people are mesmerized, and then they 
play some mood music for about 45 minutes to an hour to warm up the act and get them in a very passive, suggestive state. And they get some guy who, who walk in to start with. All these faith healers have done much the same thing. Somebody's got a little bit of a limp and they, they, they hobble in, listen, you shouldn't, let's get you uh, up close. In fact, one of our ushers will give you a wheelchair and while you're down and get seat right in front. And you don't have to worry about, you know, walking with a little bit of a, a walking in, impediment. So they call these people up on stage and they get them out of the wheelchair and it looks like they've been cured of being crippled. Now they can walk. They walked in to start with. You see how it's done? But they don't show that. They only show the person getting out of the chair later on and walking like this and say, you know, work it out. God, will, it'll get better. Work it out. It takes time. They don't tell you that the person walked in at the beginning of the meeting in the first place. They've all done things like this. But it's to milk people's donations. And but a guy who's or a man or a woman who's reading their Bible and uh, using a little common sense, if you've got some, you'll you'll begin to spot these phone. You'll begin to see it's an all stage play. It's an act. It's a show. P.T. Barnum was right. There's a sucker born every minute, and most of them start tucking in their love gift, right, <laughs> sending it to these these people. But that kind of miraculous healing was a sign to get the attention of Israel. And 1 Corinthians 1, about verse 20, says, For the Greeks seek after wisdom, the Jews require a sign. The Greek wants to understand it, the, the, the Gentile. He wants to understand it intellectually before he believes in it. The Shemite, the Jew, he's persuaded when he sees something miraculous happen. That this is indeed God's man. I'm going to listen to what else he has to say. But um, <clears throat> let's move on. And, uh, we're at verse 23. Go forward just a little bit before we leave verse 23 to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew 8, and also with your third hand, Mark chapter 1. Matthew 8 and Mark chapter 1. Matthew 8, verse 16. When the even, in your King James Bible, that's just a short spelling for evening. When the evening, or even, was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Now look forward at Mark chapter 1, verses 32 to 34. Mark 1, verses 32 through 34. Here Mark is recording the very same event. And at even, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at, this, at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. I dealt with this apparent contradiction in my book a couple of years ago on contradictions. Matthew's text says he healed all that were sick. Mark's text says he healed many that were sick. So which was it? Did he heal all, or did he heal just many. The truth is, many people came to him and he healed all the ones that were sick. That's all it means. It's not a difficulty. You just put two verses together and usually the rest of the verse or verses here will explain the entire event. But people are looking for any excuse to ignore the Bible. So they'll imagine a contradiction where none really exists. Verses 24 and 25, back in our text, Matthew 4, verses 24 and 25, we're almost done. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, 
and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. Syria at that time was north of the Sea of Galilee, but it bordered a land called the land of Phoenicia, which no longer exists, along the coast of the Mediterranean. Now it's just the country of Syria, north of the modern state of Israel. And uh, it says here, possessed with devils, and also those which were lunatic. Lunatic, from lunar, meaning the moon, is means someone who's moonstruck. And that was the idea that, you know, wolves or coyotes uh, are supposed to begin howling at night when the full moon comes out, right? And werewolves and all that nonsense. We used to have a, a loving dog. A, uh, Elizabeth had a dog. And a uh, sweet dog, but when the sun would go down, he was outside, Darby, uh, he would bark quite a bit when the when it became nighttime. I mean, he'd settle down eventually, but some animals do that. And it's the idea that something, uh, because they see the full moon in the sky, has an effect on people and causes them to go crazy. The police department in Fullerton did a, a, a released a report years ago. And you've heard the story that there's an increase in crime or there's an increase in emergencies in the ER on full moons because people commit more crime and do more crazy things uh, under a full moon than at other times during the month. At least that's uh, commonly told among people. But truthfully, there are people with some physical ailments, some physical um, defect or limitations, some organic cause for their behavior that isn't apparent to all of us, has nothing to do with someone being disobedient to God or doing something that would uh, do the work of the devil or reject the word of God or reject the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some people, uh, the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 5, about verse 4, the Christian is to comfort the feeble-minded, verse 14, excuse me, comfort the feeble-minded. And so you and I, uh, people don't give the Bible credit. They want to say, well, everybody in the Bible that might have had some natural, medically explainable mental problem or deficiency, uh, Christians said, oh, they were possessed with the devils. Not so. The Bible makes a distinction between those who had some natural, probably explainable mental problem and those who were controlled by devils because of their sin. So don't sell the Bible short and say the Bible doesn't know what it's talking about. Of course it does. But modern man doesn't want to give the Bible credit. But the Bible uses both phrases, those possessed with devils and those which were lunatic. Two separate categories. We don't use the word lunatic much. It's one of those not politically correct uh, terms. For some reason, I guess, demon-possessed uh, um, never goes out of style. <laughs> For some reason, people will still use it, I guess, if they want to curse, cuss somebody out. But... Um, for some reason, lunatic is not supposed to be used. It's not. It's an offensive term. You're, you're belittling someone. You're not really. It's just one of those terms that gets comes into social or societal use. It doesn't mean an offense to anybody. But you and I are to comfort the feeble-minded and pray for those who have something. It's often you often hear Christians say, "I can't, I can't understand." The Bible. I can't understand the the scripture. I want to learn more. I want to pay attention more. I just for some reason can't seem to. But then after a while, you start talking to them. You see how much they actually have learned, because they've been in love with the Word of God, and their love for the Bible, however much or little they read it, uh, has been a blessing to them, and they they they've grown much more than they realize they've grown. And that's always a blessing to meet someone like that. 